just to talk a little bit about um, undercover policing, and I'm focusing on sexual relationships, although as, as Alison's mentioned, there are a whole number of different issues which are covered in the public inquiry, which we'll come to towards the end. Those are the points that I'm going to cover. When the women first came together, it all came about really at the time when Mark Kennedy was exposed as an undercover police officer in late 2010, early 2011. And as a result of the very public exposure of him, other women like Alison, like Helen and others who suspected for a long time that the man that just suddenly disappeared out of their life might have been uh, or was a, a police spy, um, were finally able to come out and speak because they were no longer kind of met with the, that um, response that says this sort of thing doesn't happen in this country. We don't have uh, police officers infiltrating it to that level. Uh, and we're able to say, well, clearly it has happened. And they all came together and we, we ended up with a group of eight. And I talk a bit as we because it was a very unusual and coll collective legal process. Um, it wa wasn't a lawyer telling, you know, kind of advising the clients what to do very much. The clients were part of the case and were very much focusing and directing the case as we, as we went along and I think that was a very important part of the process. And, and at the beginning we had to decide, well, what, what is it that you actually want to achieve through legal remedies? And of course legal remedies are limited. Um, you know, what, it, what is the best way? And, and we chose in the end um, a, a civil claim um, because uh, when you bring a, a, a claim, uh, a civil claim, um, you, you are in control of that claim. You're not asking the police to investigate the police. So you don't make a formal complaint and ask the police to investigate. We are directing, we are saying this is our case, you have to answer for it. And that's why we chose a civil remedy, even though ultimately a civil remedy is directed towards compensation, which isn't necessarily um, you know, the main thing that we, we sought, but it is an opportunity to, um, to try and flesh out some of those issues and get some answers through disclosure uh, it, through the court process. We then had to identify what were the causes of action that we could potentially take these ones listed here uh, were the ones that we thought were all potentially applicable. In relation to the, uh, uh, the Human Rights Act claims, um, the Human Rights Act only came in in 2000, um, so any of the relationships like Alison's that happened before the year 2000, we couldn't bring a Human Rights Act claim, even though in many ways that, that was the most obvious thing, these are a human rights violation. So, we brought the claim against this chap here who represents the Metropolitan Police, he's a commissioner, Bernard Hogan Hart. Um, and so you sue the, the head of the police who is vicariously liable for the acts of all his officers. The Human Rights Act, as I said, only applies to relationships post-2000. And the two articles under the European Convention that we identified was obviously Article 8, which is the right to privacy and family life. It was a clear violation of that, but it is a qualified right. So you have to show that any violation of that right was disproportionate. So insofar as the police spying or undercover uh, action might have been justified, and that's a big question at all in, in most of these cases, um, what, what was, was that level of uh, intrusion into people's lives justified? Now at the time the Human Rights Act was passed, uh, we also uh, had the introduction of REAP, which I'll come to in a moment. Article 3, um, which is not to be subject to inhumane and degrading treatment. That is an absolute right, so there's no question of qualification. It's a high threshold. Rape, which I'll also come back to in a minute, uh, it would amount to a violation of Article 3. REPA, uh, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. It was brought in at the time of the Human Rights Act in 2000 because uh, it was recognised that if there was going to be uh, a right to privacy, what happens in relation to all the powers that the police and the intelligence services have, which do breach privacy. So there's a whole regulatory framework that was set up under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, and it should have meant that uh, any um, activity in terms of undercover policing 
had to be authorised in advance, it had to be considered carefully and authorised. And we considered that clearly it was hard to imagine that these acts could have been authorised. The difficulty with REPA is that it means that any claim under the Human Rights Act has to go to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which is a separate court, and it's a highly secretive court. It doesn't have open hearings, uh, it has no way in which you can necessarily have access to the evidence, and you don't necessarily know the reasons for any decision that the court may come to at the end. You may simply be told either there's been a finding of violation or not a finding of violation, and you have no right of appeal. So we didn't want to go to the IPT. However, we felt that there was an argument that um, the I, that, that REPA did not apply in these cases because it was inconceivable that sexual relationships could be authorised under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. So that was an argument we had, which was in this case of AKJ and others. If anyone's interested in looking that up, it's a case that went to the Court of Appeal, but we lost. So in the end, we couldn't pursue the Human Rights Act claims. But at the same time, we also wanted to pursue common law claims, tort claims. Uh, and uh, again, there were um, a number of different torts that we identified that might be claims that you could bring, uh, arising from the experiences uh, of these women. Uh, now, the first one, which is, which is perhaps a controversial one, is whether, in fact, um, the, the acts complained of amounted to an assault or effectively uh, a rape, a sexual assault. Um, and the question here is that did the women actually give consent to these relationships? Did they give consent to sexual intercourse or sexual intimacy? Uh, and um, there is a lot of uh, case law in relation to um, consent. Uh, and the question is in what circumstance is consent vitiated by deceit. And the law is very unclear and it is changing. There are certain examples like if somebody pretends to be a doctor to do a breast exam and it turns out that they're not a doctor at all, that would be a clear case of a vitiation of consent. But there are other cases where it is felt, you know, if, if for example a man says that he's a billionaire in a relationship and it turns out that he's a poor man, that does not amount to a vitiation of consent. So there are a whole kind of lots and lots of legal papers and discussions uh, about in what circumstances uh, consent is, is, is vitiated by deceit. Here we go. I don't know if you recognise these two people. On the left is a man called Jim Boiling. He was in a relationship with a couple of the women we represented. And on the right is a woman called Gail Euland. Jim Boiling, there was an investigation. One of the women who had a relationship with him complained. The police in investigated. The CPS made a decision that this did not amount to a sexual assault. It didn't even amount to misconduct in public office because it was clear that he had genuine feelings. The woman on the right is a young, vulnerable woman who had a secretive lesbian relationship with another young woman who claimed that she was impersonating a man and that she believed that she was actually a man all the way through and suddenly discovered she was a, a woman. This woman was convicted of sexual assault and sentenced to eight years in prison. Um, so here we have uh, an illustration of the law operating in a, in a clearly, in my view, a grotesquely discriminatory uh, way. What, what, what is the distinction between a woman impersonating a man uh, and a police officer impersonating an activist? Negligence, I won't go through all the principles, but what we were trying to establish here, and this was very important also, was that it wasn't just the individual officers who were responsible for this, but it was authorised, it was known about, these officers were supervised. We, we don't know to what extent it went right up to the top, but um, you know, we, we wanted to establish that there was a, a claim, you know, a very strong claim uh, of negligence in terms of the supervision of those officers. Um, I won't go into the law in relation to that, but if you're 
law students, you all know um, the case of Hill against the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire um, and the difficulties in bringing negligence claims which we felt we could argue around in this particular case. So the last two uh, torts that we identified uh, were deceit, uh, which I, I think sort of speaks for itself, um, and uh, misfeasance in public office. Now, the, the only issues we had in relation to those two causes of action uh, were that you had to prove that the person had suffered damage. And again, looking at the law and, and perhaps the sexist way in which the law operates, there are particular ways in which the law recognises damage and there are other ways in which the law doesn't recognise damage in an obvious way. It doesn't, for example, recognise damage if you've lost five years of your life. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, recognise damage if you've lost the opportunity to have children. Um, and and there, are, there are a number of other ways in which there is no way. It doesn't, doesn't recognise damage if, if, you're, if, you, if you're deeply distressed and shock, shocked, unless you can fit that experience into a psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, and, 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 and we had to do that in each of those cases. So each of the clients had to go through a psych psychological assessment to see whether we could try and fit them into a diagnosis box. And, 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 and for some, that actually turned out to be incredibly easy um, because, because the sort of damage that they'd suffered was immediately ticked a lot of symptoms that fitted into a box. For some, it was more difficult. And again, the experience of undergoing a psych psychological assessment was found by some of, the, some of the women to be deeply painful and intrusive because we had to serve those reports ultimately on the police. With the um, psychiatric damage, we could then try and also claim financial loss if we could show that it affected the ability to work, uh, for example. Um, so that, that was the way in which we built up the civil claims. So just in terms of bringing those claims, we met many, many barriers. Um, as I mentioned before, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, in the end we had to drop the Human Rights Act claims because we didn't want to go into the secret tribunal. Um, that, that's the AKJ case. And, and then the other one which um, Alison has referred to is um, something that didn't immediately assert itself but suddenly popped up like this and then has proven to be a huge barrier. It's something called neither confirm nor deny. Um, and, uh, and this is something that, that meant that the police said they couldn't defend the claim because they had a policy that they could neither confirm nor deny. And they wouldn't move on that until we brought a claim called Dill and Others, which is, is a case which is now relied on quite heavily in the public inquiry, which we managed to slightly break down the barriers uh, in relation to what circumstances the police could neither confirm nor deny. By the time we brought this claim, all the officers were all out in the public domain, having been exposed. One of the officers, Mark Kennedy, um, you know, had been all over the place saying I was an undercover officer. Uh, and two other officers, um, also Bob Lambert and Jim Boiling, um, were, were confirmed in one way or another. However, that did leave two other officers, uh, one of which is Mark Jenner, who we've seen all over the press and here, uh, and John Dines, who um, Helen will talk about a bit. Um, because they weren't publicly exposed, uh, the police are still able to say we can neither confirm nor deny that they were a police officer. And this, this policy of neither confirm nor deny meant that we never got to the stage of disclosure, which, um, and we never got any, anything back from our Data Protection Act requests, because the police were so determined not to give us one ounce of information, uh, not one scintilla of a piece of information about anything to do with those undercover activities, that ultimately um, they pushed us towards a settlement by way of something called Part 36 offers, um, which, which is just a device that, that pushes you in a civil claim towards a, towards a settlement. But what we did manage to do was have a mediation in which uh, we, we really pushed for something 
in addition to compensation, which was a recognition that the relationships with these women were abusive, deceitful, manipulative and wrong. We have this chap, who's an assistant chief commissioner, Martin Hewitt, reading this um, very strong and powerful <laughs> apology uh, over the television, uh, uh, and recognising that uh, these relationships were a violation of women's human rights and abuse of police power and cause significant trauma. Uh, and most uh, importantly, they should never have happened. They were wrong. They were a gross violation of personal dignity and integrity. Recognition that there were failures of supervision and management. Uh, and that uh, even with the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, uh, these relationships were still able to occur, which is deeply worrying. That, that, that we hope, is, a, is quite an important victory and creates a precedent of sorts. Despite the years we've struggled to get this far, we still don't have the disclosure. Uh, we still don't have any answers we st about why these officers were doing what they were, were they, what were the reasons, as, as Alison talked about so powerfully before. So um, there is a public inquiry. At the moment, there are about 180 odd non-state, non-police core participants who come from a whole range of different experiences. Um, and uh, we are trying, as a, a very, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge, we're trying to have a united front. Uh, there's about 10 to 12 solicitors representing a whole range of different core participants. And we're trying as best we can to to have a, have, a, have a united front against the police, who, of course, have a, have a united front trying to assert that NCMD has to apply. So there are two major challenges, legal challenges at the moment. One applies to restriction orders. What can be out in the public domain in the public inquiry? What can, can the police rely on NCMD? Uh, or will most of the hearing be in secret? And if it is, is that, can this possibly be a public inquiry? And the second thing relates to something called undertakings, which is about um, you know, to what extent we, we want to, to encourage, on the one hand, the police to speak out about, um, uh, without fear of, of being prosecuted. So do we, do we accept that, that even though some of what they did was criminally wrong, that there should be some guarantee that they're, they're not prosecuted so that they will actually give evidence that, that, you know, rather than remain silent. And, and, and on the other hand, and, and, you know, because what the police were doing was investigating, uh, allegedly, or what they will seek to do is to say, well, they, the reason that they were doing this kind of undercover activity was because they were gathering intelligence on criminal activity. Um, they will, there is an issue about the extent to which core participants may, um, may have fears about being incriminated themselves and, and fears about giving evidence. So there are issues about um, offering undertakings to the non-state core participants and whether those should be broader, because they are after all the victims, than any undertakings offered to the police. So that's really where we're at. We're at very early days of the public inquiry. And whether it proves to be anything useful um, uh, as an exercise in exposing undercover policing remains to be seen.